Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. My name is Kitty and I recently completed a NIHR Academic Clinical Fellowship or the ACF in Vascular Surgery from ST1 to ST3 and I'm now taking time out of training to complete a PhD. It's been a very fruitful three years for me so I thought I would just share with you today my experience at the ACF, what I did, what I got out of it and my honest thoughts on what was good and what was bad. Hopefully this is useful to those of you who are considering in applying to ACF yourselves to give you an idea of whether it is right for you, what to expect. And of course, this is my own experience only and ACFs can vary really widely across the UK. If you're looking for specific information and tips about applying to the ACF, please do check out the dedicated videos on my channel, which will be linked in the description below. So as always, we will start with an upfront summary. Overall, I found the NIHR ACF extremely useful to provide academic time alongside my clinical training, and I really, really enjoyed it. Purely talking numbers, I was able to publish 14 peer-reviewed papers in this time with seven as first author, six international and national presentations, three national prizes, and I was successful in obtaining four research grants, one of which is the highly competitive NIHR Doctoral Research Fellowship, which is funding the PhD that I'm currently undertaking. The ACF also funded me to attend a number of short courses and a PG cert in data science, where I gained valuable research skills. Balancing academic and clinical work is however challenging and can be frustrating depending on individual units and placements. So first, let's talk about the structure of the ACF. If you're unfamiliar with it, please make sure you check out my overview video, but essentially it is an NIHR funded post that gives you 25% research time over three years, so around nine months, alongside 75% of clinical time. You can enter ACF at any point between ST1 to ST4. So in my case, I entered ACF at ST1 and I finished at the end of ST3, which meant that my academic time ran parallel to core surgical training and my first year as a vascular registrar. How the 25% academic time is practically rotated into your work is variable based on your academic unit and your specialty. In the southwest where I'm based, surgical trainees tend to get these by day release, so you get a day a week of academic time throughout the three years. Your academic days were always on your elective work days and you maintain a 100% on-call rotor. And this is likely because as a craft specialty in surgery, our supervisors and training program director or TPD preferred for us not to have extended periods of time away from practical experience, which does make sense. However, I know that many of the ACFs and medical specialties in my deanery tend to have academic research blocks. So instead of a day release, they might have three months a year, which is entirely ring fenced for their academic work, during which time they won't do any clinical work or any on calls. One of my friends completing a GP ACF will have this spanned over four years, where the first two years comprised of 100% clinical time and the last two years were split into 50-50 academic and clinical time, so it really is highly variable. Personally, I prefer the day release arrangement so that I could carry out work that spanned over three years rather than being confined to academic blocks. But my work is also very database, and perhaps if you were doing a lab-based project which demands more day-to-day -day time, then a block release might be more suitable for you. Ultimately, I felt the structure of the ACF academic time is mostly determined by your TPD, your academic supervisor, and the precedent set by your previous trainees. So in terms of my experience at the ACF, first of all, let's talk about the research, because after all, this is the main component of the Academic Clinical Fellowship. And unlike the Specialized Foundation Program, or the SFP, which is all about dipping your foot into the water in clinical academia, the ACF is really about starting to develop your own research interests and skills. So to this end, there's virtually zero guidance, I would say, from the academic school or the deanery about what you should be doing. And there's no hard requirements on what you have to achieve by the end of the three years or what you have to deliver at the end of your ACF. You're almost entirely guided by your supervisor and your research department, and of course, a lot of self-direction as well to lead your projects to completion. Annually at your ARCP, you're required to submit an extra document detailing all the academic work that you've been involved in through the year. Throughout my ACF, I was involved in several major projects, which mainly surrounded medically optimizing vascular patients around their surgery. I'm very much a quantitative researcher myself, and I felt I was really able to significantly develop my skills during the ACF, through a funded uh, postgraduate certificate in data science, and then by applying this by experiential learning to funded research projects where I analyzed big data from national databases. 
I was very lucky to be placed in a proactive academic unit where my supervisors are very present and as a result I really did enjoy my work a lot. One thing that I don't think most people realise though, and I certainly didn't until about halfway through, is that the main and most important outcome from an ACF is actually obtaining a grant to fund for a PhD. If you're someone who already has a higher degree, then this is about getting the money to fund another research project beyond your ACF. And this is arguably the most critical measure of whether an ACF is considered successful, or at least from the point of view of the university and the NIHR. And this is because the NIHR ACF is considered a pre-doctoral post, and so its main function is to prepare you to undertake a higher research degree. Everything else is then kind of secondary to this. So it's not really about how many publications or presentations you get out of the ACF, but rather how will you complete preliminary research that will support a grant application, building your research skills, including grant writing and bulking up your CV in order to get you there. I must admit, most of my research was actually done in the first half or first two years of my ACF post, keeping this in mind. And for the second half and the last year of my ACF, I was almost purely focused on just writing my grant application for the NI Child Doctoral Fellowship. I was very lucky to be successful in getting it in the end, but it really took a lot of time and effort to put this together, and it's not something to be underestimated. Many doctoral fellowships have to be submitted up to a year before you actually finish your ACF and start your PhD. So like most things in academia, you really have to plan ahead and operate on a much tighter timeline than you expect. As I mentioned in the beginning, I had a pretty good amount of output from my ACF with 14 publications, four research grants and three national prizes, which undoubtedly did boost my application to showcase my research skills and experience. However, it was probably more important that I demonstrated how I came up with the research proposal for my doctoral application and how my prior research experience and skills made me a strong candidate to deliver my research proposal. If you're thinking about an ACF or are currently doing one, just do keep this in mind. If you'd like to hear more about my experience with applying to an NIHR doctoral fellowship, do let me know in the comment section below and I'll consider making a video about it in the future. Finally, outside of doing my own research, I also did a lot of peer reviews for journals during my ACF, which allowed me to develop my critical appraisal and editorial skills. Doing peer reviews also encouraged me to read around a lot more topics and recent evidence, which directly fed back into my clinical practice and knowledge. By the end of the three years, I was appointed to the editorial board of the EJVS, which is the highest impact factor journal in vascular surgery. Next, let's talk about training and development. So instead of any prescribed teaching or learning curriculum, the NIHR ACF post comes with some funding for you to undertake training of your choice. So again, it's very much self-directed by you. This varies a little by deanery, but in our academic unit, when I came through, this was £7,500 budget over three years, with a recommended split of £3,000 of conferences and the rest for courses. However, because I started my ACF during the COVID pandemic and in light of travel restrictions, I was able to essentially be pretty flexible about how I wanted to use my study budget. I ended up using £6,000 of my budget to pay for an online distance learning postgraduate certificate in health data science, which is delivered by the University of Edinburgh. The reason that I wanted to attend this course specifically was because I knew that I needed to develop the necessary skills in data analysis and coding. And whilst it is possible to self-learn this with online content these days, I wanted to follow a more formal systematic curriculum. And I have to say, I really don't regret doing this at all. It was actually one of the most useful courses that I have ever done. And by the end, I was very comfortable with using R to analyze big data sets. And in particular, this course taught not only how to perform certain analysis, such as you know, regression analysis or model building, which you can kind of easily look up and copy the code, but it also taught me how to check that your analysis was valid, which I'm not sure that I would have specifically looked at or picked up if I was learning this myself. And of course, the PG search didn't cover absolutely everything that I needed to know for some of the analysis that I ended up doing for my projects. And of course, it won't cover everything that I will ever need to know, but it did provide a good baseline knowledge for me to build on going forward. Using the study budget, I was also able to attend some local university short courses focused on specific research methodology skills in course of inference. 
Attending both these courses and the PG Cert, I have to say, also came in extremely useful for my grant applications because I could then demonstrate on paper that I had the necessary skills to deliver on research proposals. Finally, I did claim some money for conferences and presentations, and this was very helpful in conjunction with the clinical study budget afforded to trainees, particularly in the Southwest. Often the clinical surgical budget might cover the conference registration, but not the travel fees. So in these instances, I would essentially use the ACF budget to cover the rest. There is no official requirement for educational leadership activities as part of the ACF. However, this is often something that your university or academic department might expect you to participate in. And certainly for many doctoral applications like the NIHRDRF, you might be asked about your prior experiences and further development plans. During my ACF, I co-supervised several BSc and MSc students for their projects and dissertation alongside my professor, in addition to informally supervising other medical students and foundation doctors who wanted to complete research projects in our unit. This was actually quite a valuable experience as I stepped into a more senior role, both clinically and academically. And additionally, I delivered teaching events both locally and at national events. And as I became a registrar, I also gave more and more ad hoc teaching on a day to day basis, a skill that no one really teaches you about um, and you have to learn on the job. So having that additional exposure in the academic world is actually quite useful. In recognition of my work, I was nominated and won the ACIT Silver Sutra Award for being an outstanding surgical registrar trainer this year, which was extremely humbling and really goes to show that actually making the effort to teach your juniors does make a difference and leads to rewards on both sides. For leadership, I completed another two year tenure in the national post as the secretary and treasurer of the Ruling Club, which is the UK Vascular Trainees Association. I was also advised to consider leadership courses during this time, but I ended up working this into my doctoral application instead, as was one of the requirements. Finally, balancing clinical and academic time in an academic post is a perpetual challenge and it is no different for the ACF. And I have to say, this is probably the only real downside to doing an academic clinical fellowship because at times it really did feel very frustrating and very stressful and probably the least enjoyable element of the whole thing. As surgeons, we all want to operate as much as possible. So it feels a little jarring to feel like your academic time is limiting your time in theatres. And especially because I was maintaining 100% on call, the burden of my academic time essentially is falling entirely on my elective days. And if you happen to be in a rotation where you do weeks of nights or weeks of on calls, this pretty much means that you would just not ever have an academic day on that week entirely. In terms of how much of an issue this is for your progression is somewhat dependent on the specific rotation that you're going through. On one of my core surgical training rotations for six months in one particular hospital, the on-call rotor was extremely heavy because of short staffing. And so I calculated that if I were to take my one day a week academic time in full, this would leave me with only eight days of elective activities in six months. And that's before even taking any annual leave or study leave. And that was clearly not feasible. As a result, I could only take half the academic time that I was supposed to have from this rotation. And even then I had feedback that the consultant team thought that I should have had more elective operating experience, even though essentially it was entirely out of my hands. In contrast, in another hospital where the rotor was less busy, I had no issues getting a similar number of cases on my e-log book compared to my non-academic colleagues, and I felt like I made significant progress in my surgical training. As with most surgical trainees, I must also admit that I am guilty sometimes of coming in on my zero days to operate. But I think this is not really a problem unique to academics. Um, but ultimately, at the end of the day, I was able to meet all of my ARCP clinical competencies throughout all three years of my ACF. All in all, I found balancing clinical and academic time a constant source of stress during the ACF. This is mostly low level, um, but particular rotations can be harder than others. And I found that I really had to stand my ground to protect my academic time, which most of you clinical supervisors and colleagues may not particularly care about or pay attention to. 
And it feels that sometimes, despite my best efforts at communicating with my supervisors or TPD, and despite the fact that I should be theoretically supernumerary because the NIHR pays for my posts, the academic time is often lost to accommodate service provision. And unfortunately, this is quite a pervasive feeling across clinical academics at all levels. So if you're going into an ACF post or any academic post really, just know that this is not just a question to ask and know the answer to you in your interview. It is reality and it is really hard getting the balance right and it is really hard to protect your academic time. On the bright side though, because my ACF came with a run through training number, it meant that I did not have to stress about ST3 applications like many of my core trainee colleagues. Coupled with having done my MRCS exams before ST1, it meant that I could focus all my time during my ACF on my clinical training and academic work without stressing about progression. Seeing as the competition ratios are getting harder every year, I definitely did not envy my colleagues who were trying to apply to specialty training and stressing about it in CT2. So in summary, I really, really enjoyed my ACF and it has definitely affirmed my interest in a career in clinical academia. I have no regrets whatsoever, and if I could go back in time, I would definitely do it all again without question. I have learned a huge amount during these last three years through funded courses and a PG search that I otherwise would not have done, supplemented with experiential learning in conducting high quality research. I have networked and made connections with multiple key opinion leaders in my field who continues to help progress my career. I've achieved a significant amount of academic output and I got a fully funded PhD through a competitive process that I think whilst not impossible would certainly have been harder without the academic time and resources that came with the ACF. I was also encouraged to reach outside of my comfort zones in all areas of research, leadership and education, which were all key skills to develop as I enter a more senior stage in my training. And perhaps most importantly, the knowledge that I gained from doing my research and my editorial work has also made me a better clinician with a better understanding of the evidence underpinning our clinical practice. The trade-off for these accomplishments is, as ever, time and effort. The ACF is significantly more self-directed than the SFP, so you have to be prepared to drive your own projects and applications forward. There's no guarantee of significant academic output or a higher degree at the end of it all, and this is really down to you and your hard work. The academic work will never really fit neatly into a block of academic time or day release, so you will inevitably be working on things in your own time, whether it's a weekend or an evening after work. You will be doing less than your full-time clinical colleagues, and you will have a harder time trying to make this work in the current landscape of an NHS focused on getting service provision out of its doctors. However, overall, personally, I found that the benefits of the ACF was well worth the drawbacks. And I hope that this has been helpful for those of you wondering about the ACF and that it will help you make an informed choice about whether or not it is for you. And for those of you who are already applying, I hope that this has given you some more information that you can use in your own application and your interview process. Once again, if you're looking for more information about the application and the interview process, please do have a look at the dedicated videos on my channel for this, which will be again linked in the description below. Don't forget to leave a like and subscribe for more contents like this.